and all of this area was part of the Holy Roman Empire. But the Holy Roman Emperors did not have the right to tax, and they didn't have the right to hold a standing army. They could get the people that were under them, part of the Holy Roman Empire, to bring their soldiers anytime they needed them and so forth. But it was not a very powerful job. It was sort of an honorary job. And Frederick Barbarossa had gone off on a crusade, and he was swimming in a stream in the, in the Taurus Mountains of eastern Turkey and died of a heart attack. Now, it may have been a heart attack, it may have been poison, nobody knows, but he died there. His son, Henry VI, the man that captured Richard the Lionhearted, made Italy pay a ton and a half of gold for his, for his uh, ransom, married the last of the princesses of Sicily, Constance. And Constance was not young. She'd been married twice before with no children. So they got married, and she got pregnant, and she was nearly 40. So she was starting from Swabia to come back down to, to Sicily to have her baby. Well, it, her time came before she got to Sicily. So she stopped at a little town, and in order to make sure that everybody knew this child was hers, they built a pavilion in the middle of the city, square, and she had the archbishop and the magistrates and the woman, the nun in charge of the local convent, and about a half a dozen other officials, and they had soldiers stand all around the tent so that new, no baby could be slipped in, uh, because people didn't believe she was really going to have a child at 40. In those days, 40 was, old, was an old woman. Well, she had a son. This son was named Frederick for his grandfather, Frederick II. But Frederick II, she made king of Sicily at age four. His, his father died when he was about eight, and his uncle became the Holy Roman Emperor. Now something really unusual happened. When this boy became 14, the uncle had him named Holy Roman Emperor at 14. The man who had, had the title gave it up. Very unusual in monarchies and emperors. So, uh, Frederick II became Holy Roman Emperor at 14. But meanwhile, he had become educated in Latin, educated in Greek, and especially educated in Arabic, and he had Arabic teachers and Arabic ministers all his life long. He was born in 1194. And this is the man that brought Aristotle back into Italy. He was himself a scientist. He, his, as a Holy Roman Emperor, he had no palace except his palace in Sicily. So when he traveled around, he traveled around with a zoo and with scientists, and he put on demonstrations of physics, he put on demonstrations of optics, physics, and he put on uh, inclined plane demonstrations and so forth. And he talked science and, and so forth all of his life. But in addition to that, he brought universities into Italy. Now, universities were started in the early 800s in Baghdad, about the time of our friend Mahmoud. In fact, he was one of the main people that started the Dal Hikmet. And these universities were funded by the religious foundations. The religious foundations in the plural is called al -Kaf. People would leave money to a mosque and they would, to build a mosque, and then they had to leave money enough to support the mosque. They don't take up collections in mosques. You, the mosque is, is uh, supported and they, you don't pay a preacher in, in Islam. The man who does the sermon it earns his living as a lawyer or a judge or a, or a teacher. He doesn't earn his living from preaching. And the family does the pastoral care. So Islam is very different uh, from, from ours, our uh, Christianity. But uh, it works very well. And, but this al kaf has a minister in the government. So all the universities and high schools, all the schools and everything, were under the Wizarat al kaf the minister of, of, of foundations. So if he didn't like the way Gordon was teaching, he could have Do Gordon fired. But when Frederick II brought universities into Italy, Padua, Bologna, and a law school at Naples, there was no way to support them. 
Uh, there were no religious foundations, and he didn't, he was feuding with the Pope at that time, so he didn't want churches to support the universities. So he went to the city-states. These are the city-states in northern Italy. They were under the Holy Roman Empire. But the city-states had started trading along the Silk Route with Arabs. The Arabs ran the Silk Route. Here's the Silk Route. And from Aleppo here was the end of the Silk Route, all the way to Xi'an. He's got Chang'an here, but that's another name for Xi'an. You can see that sometimes they went north of the, of the Gobi Desert, sometimes south, and sometimes they went in different directions around the Caspian, and sometimes they came down through Pakistan, what's now Pakistan, sometimes they didn't. But they came and ended up in Aleppo here. And uh, Antioch is the port where they went. And the, the, these city-states had begun uh, trading with the Arabs. The Arabs controlled the western part of this, and, but Muslims were in, the guardians all the way into Xi'an in China. There are about 60 million Muslims in China now. So that the Muslims uh, were all along the Silk Road, route. So the city-states of northern Italy were trading already with the Arabs and the Muslims, even before time of Frederick. But th something happened. The city-states were fighting against the noblemen who owned all the land around, and they were fighting from time to time against the Pope, and they were fighting, they would get together, one group of them would get together against another group in the naming of new Holy Roman emperors. So, th but they were getting to be quite independent, and they invented something that we still use to this day. They incorporated, they made human their city so that you could sue the city or the city could sue you. So for the first time, we had a corporation that was not a living person. We had a, a lawsuit that was not a living person. So Frederick incorporated the universities that he founded. People could leave them money and, and so forth. As a result of this, they built up their endowments, and that is the beginning of the, of, of the uh, academic freedom that we enjoy today. Now, we, we still, East Tennessee State gets a lot of their money from the state legislature, but they also have an endowment. So it's the endowment that keeps us independent from the, from the long hand of government. And it's academic freedom began there in Italy in, for, because of the city-states and because of the fact that Frederick incorporated them. So incorporation, later the Hanseatic League along the Baltic and the North Sea used the same sense of corporation, and the city-states of Germany copied that too. So incorporation became very important. We always talk about the corporation of the, of the municipality. Even today, we use that term. It means that they can sue and be sued, and they can also handle money and raise money. So Frederick started these universities. And these universities, uh, what's a university? It's a, it's a place where you study all sorts of different things. It's not just specialized in, in medicine or just specialized in law or specialized in the other thing. But now, the education in the Arab world in the Abbasid period, was divided into three, uh, three streams. Religious education, humanities, and the Arabs were the first to put together humanities, and something called foreign studies, medicine, mathematics, and science. Each had its own methods of learning. Religious studies were done by lecture, memorization, and testing. What does that sound like? No child left behind? Uh, because if you have the truth, if you know the truth, as the, as the uh, religious studies did, then you don't need to do anything but to memorize it and be tested on it. But then humanities used research and discussion. Humanities, in, the name of humanities is the same name as the word for literature, adab. Also the name for character and, and uh, good behavior. If somebody doesn't, uh, doesn't behave properly, you say he's bel-adab. He's, he's, not, 
he's not somebody of culture. So, so uh, have I got the wrong word? Have I got it correctly? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, Adam, human, humanities was put together first. The French, the Greeks had some of this. The Greeks did discussions and so forth. But remember the methods they used. First of all, memorization. Then research, discussion. The Greeks used to say that thinking is a discussion in one head. If thinking is a discussion in one head, then discussion is very important. If you learn how to discuss, you're learning how to think. So uh, then next they used empirical observation with sciences and math. They used inductive reasoning for, for sciences. And they used hands-on experimentation. Whenever a caliph or a, a governor or a rich man had people come together, he would have somebody do an experiment. And he would also have people have discussions. The caliphs were always paying uh, bags of gold to people who won debates. So there was, all of this was what generated all of the creativity in the, in the uh, Muslim world. And much of it had begun with Greeks. But the Arabs had developed it a lot. And so when the Arabs, with Arab education under Frederick II came into Italy, it brought these things. It brought back the same Greek thinking that made the Romans great. It brought back the same uh, uh, thinking, uh, the same educational methods that made the Arabs great. And it was brought from the Greeks through the Arabs through Sicily. It wasn't the Crusaders. Most, we, well, I learned in high school that the Crusaders saw how advanced the world of Islam was, and so they came back and wanted to bring all this into Most of the Crusaders were illiterate, so they didn't learn very much about the Arabs when they were out there. But they did stop in Byzantium, and Byzantium contributed a great deal to Italy. Byzantium was very advanced in art and music, and the Arabs forbade music with their worship, and they didn't paint any human beings or any animals because they might become pagans. The one thing that Muhammad was most against was not Christians and Jews. He was against pagans and all kinds of paganism. He even happened to say that paganism, that materialism is a kind of paganism. Materialism is a kind of paganism. So uh, Islam uh, was very strong against paganism because the Arabs were all divided because each, each tribe had their own gods. And so the, uh, the uni unity of the Arabs and the unity of the Muslims was totally against paganism. So that, but the art and the music and the dancing of the Greeks came back into Italy partially through Byzantium. But that combination with Aristotle. Now, as I told you, Justinian had also banned Aristotle in the Eastern Roman Empire. So the Italians did not learn Aristotle from Byzantium. They learned maybe art and dancing, and they learned Plato, and they learned Plato's Republic and his ideas of education, uh, but they did not learn the Aristotelian open-ended discussion and the a whole open-endedness of inductive reasoning. All of our laws of, of science and so forth came from induction, empirical observation and induction. So that those came into Italy, and Italy then went from uh, uh, the Renaissance starting then around 1200 and went on down almost until Galileo. Galileo died in 1642. Newton was born in 1642. I call that the beginning of the modern world, the beginning of science, because Galileo's ideas were so important and Newton's uh, ideas of, of uh, gravity. But something else happened in 1642 that will surprise you. That's the year the first class gradu graduated from Harvard. The year Galileo died and Newton was born was the year Harvard graduated its first class. So that's something that'll help you remember that date. I call that date the first beginning of science and certainly the end of the Renaissance. But let's go back to the Renaissance again for uh, this intellectual empowerment. 
because I've talked mostly about the intellectual uh, uh, influences of the Arabs and the Muslims on the Italian Renaissance. Um, there was one other very important thing. You do not have a Renaissance, you do not have high culture unless you have money. If you have only barter, you cannot possibly save enough wheat to, to, to look after the artists and the, and, the, and the creative people. It doesn't last but, a, but one season. So until you had trade, uh, there was not enough money set aside. Of course, later on, starting in this, about 1776, when we had industry and so forth, that created a lot of wealth too. But the wealth of the northern, city, uh, northern Italian city-states, the wealth of the Medici, depended on trade. They traded through the Arabs with Africa and India, and they traded through the Arabs across the Silk Route all the way to China, and, uh, and they amassed great amounts of money. And trade, and, and this trade was based partially on some methods that the Arabs taught them. First of all, the Arab, the, the concept of an oath and a contract in Islam is absolutely sacrosanct. You are destroyed forever if you don't live up to a contract in Islam. A, con a contract is absolutely important. Well, you can't have trade all the way across uh, to China without real faith and, and trust in contracts. The Chinese, by 1200, the Muslims had letters of credit in China. Way back then, letters of credit, bills of lading, and these things are things the Arabs taught to Genoa, Venice, Florence, Cis uh, Pisa, uh, Ravenna, all of these city-states of northern Italy that became so rich and are the generators of what we call the rebirth of, cult of high culture in Italy. And so the Italian Renaissance. The, and these are agents of the rebirth. The agents of the people that did it were, of course, uh, the academies that Alexander had built, and then um, the uh, Muslim interest in, in um, intellectual uh, pursuits, and then the Abbasids, who taught us these other things, and then one other thing. Mahmoud in 806, was in Tashkent. Tashkent is about just, it's, uh, Tashkent is about where they wrote, wrote Kashgar. Kashgar is down here in China, but the, that's Tashkent near Samarkand and Bukhara. And there was a paper mill there. Uh, uh, they were, had sheets of silk, and they would put rice, uh, rice that had been boiled into a kind of a paste on it, and let it dry, and then peel it off, you had rice paper. Did it with wheat, had wheat paper. So for the first time, he brought back paper in 806 to Baghdad. By 830, there were more libraries in Baghdad than there had been uh, books in Baghdad before. Why? Before that time, they wrote on papyrus, and they wrote on parchment. Very expensive, but most important, very slow for writing. You had to move very slowly to write on parchment or, or on, on, uh, on um, a par, uh, 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 can't, can't think of papyrus, sorry. But once you had paper, everything began to run. There's one other thing, too, that the Arabs did at this, that they brought into Europe that absolutely changed everything. They brought numerals. We call them Arabic numerals. Do you know what the Arabs call them? Haruf Hindi, Indian numerals. They got them from Sanskrit in India. And they put the zero with them and gave us the decimal system. Can you imagine doing algebra with Roman numerals? Can you imagine doing any of the things that have made our Western world so important with Roman numerals? This made a huge change. 
this was a, this was a, uh, a, a tremendous difference intellectually for the world when we stopped using uh, 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 alphabet for, for numbers and used the decimal system and used paper. So these things were brought into Italy too. These are instruments of this rebirth. So now I have given you uh, an idea of how, why I think that the Arabs and the Muslims have not been given proper credit for the reflowering of the rebirth of culture in Italy. And so when you hear people read books about the Renaissance, remind them that they've got to go to Frederick and they've got to go back to the Arab Islamic roots. 